Greetings, everyone. I want to welcome you to this uh, glorious Greenfield evening and this uh, wonderful week of, uh, of uh, uh, convocation. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, our, our talk tonight, which is sponsored by the History Department, the Office of Alumni Relations, and um, the Experimental College. And I'm Rusty Russell. I'm chair of the Joint Student and Faculty Board of the Experimental uh, experimental or X College, um, I guess because it's X-rated uh, <laughs> this year. Um, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Saul Gittleman. Um, Saul came to Tufts in 1964 as an assistant professor uh, in the German department, and he became uh, chair of the department two years later in 1966. Uh, as you know, he was provost of Tufts for 21 years, from 1981 until 2002 and served under three of our last university presidents. Um, after he retired from the provost position, um, he was named the Alice and Nathan Yancher University Professor and took that opportunity to write this book, the uh, and Entre Entrepreneurial, sorry, it's late today, <laughs> University, The Transformation of Tufts, 1976 to 2002 which is uh, a thorough, and I understand, opinionated and uh, extremely interesting uh, history of this university. And we're all hoping to see uh, a sequel very soon. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to introduce Saul Gilman. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to get you back to the game as fast as I can. Um, this is a topic that lends itself to the technology of PowerPoint. It would be very nice to show you dignified 19th century faces with a lot of facial hair, oil paintings of Professors Row in Powderhouse Square with horse-drawn carriages, a few buildings and country spaces, and a walnut hill with one lonely but stately building on it. That makes for a nice PowerPoint. Uh, and that building would bear the name, by the way, of the first president of Tufts, Blue Hall. But then I said, who needs it? They're all up there in Coolidge Room anyway. All you have to do is walk up to the Coolidge Room and you'll see them all. And uh, there are paintings in Ballou Hall all over the place with very great scenes of the university. Besides, it's time to use a little imagination. Close your eyes and see the bucolic hill surrounded by a dirt road called Professor's Row with two lonely houses built in the 1860s, one by the first dean of the Divinity School, which is no longer here, and the other by a president named Capon. He still bears his name on that house, Capon House. Then let your mind's eye conjure up what seemed like an endless expanse of green extending all the way to Massachusetts Avenue, interrupted only by a small cluster of village houses surrounding the newly named Davis Square. It all started with a Protestant denomination that wanted a place to prepare its ministers. These were the Universalists, an unusually nice bunch of people, not like the early Protestants who founded colleges. After all, among the earliest faculty of Harvard, founded by Congregationalists in 1636, were some who walked among those who hanged the Quaker Mary Dyer in 1660, first nailing her tongue to the roof of her mouth so she couldn't speak. If you go to the Boston Common, you can see the monument to Mary Dyer right under the State House, where she was hanged by basically the faculty of Harvard. <laughs> Let's face it. The earliest Protestants in America who came here looking for religious freedom were utterly intolerant. The French Huguenots had their houses burned to the ground. Calvinists who thought that the Harvard Congregationalists were godless went off to New Haven to found Yale. Baptists who were being drowned on the banks of the Charles River fled to Rhode Island to establish Brown. Evangelical Presbyterians, certain that God was about to arrive in New Jersey, went down to establish Princeton. They all generally despised each other and established these institutions for the exclusive purpose of training clergy and keeping their parishioners away from the other denominations. But not the Universalists. They preached a message of universal love and acceptance and professed the belief in universal salvation. No one the church wanted universal salvation. Presbyterians said, we'll get saved, they're going to hell. And not the, the Universalists were different. They believed that a God of love would not create a person knowing that that person would be destined for eternal damnation, like so many of the other Protestant denominations believed. They concluded that all people must be destined for salvation. Nice folks. 
A prominent Universalist layman named Charles Tufts gave the land, Walnut Hill, and the Universalist Church gave the first president in 1852, Hosea Ballou II. At the dedication of the college, he saw only a cornerstone of the future building that would eventually bear his name. When that first edifice was completed, education began with four professors and seven students and a mission to be a universalist light on the hill in Medford. Ironically, the two sister institutions chronologically established in Massachusetts around Tufts were both Catholic, Holy Cross and Boston College, so that when the Tufts president marches at future presidential inaugurations at other institutions, institutions he finds himself sandwiched between two priests. <laughs> it's not surprising that the first four presidents of Tufts College were Universalist ministers. Hosea Ballou II got the big building named after him. Alonzo Ames Minor got a smaller building, Minor Hall. Elmer Hewitt Capon gave his house and got his, resident, got his name on the residence on, on Professor's Row and they named that after him, Capon House. And Frederick W. Hamilton, the last clergyman to be president of Tufts, wound up with a swimming pool. <laughs> Each of the first four at one point or another faced bankruptcy for this internally poor college, but managed to save the college from extinction. President Hamilton only got a swimming pool named after him, probably because he was opposed to co-education and some of the more activist women wanted probably to drown him. He succeeded in separating the women who had been admitted for the first time under President Capon in 1893. President Hamilton created a separate college, Jackson, in 1911 to keep the women away from the men. He also wanted a separate faculty, but that never happened because there never was enough money. Capon and Hamilton had been Tufts undergraduates also. William Leslie Hooper, acting president from 1912 to 1914, was the first Tufts faculty member to serve as president. He built a residence at 124 Professors Row that's now named after him, Hooper Infirmary, Hooper Infirmary. He also got an electrical, he was also an electrical engineer and physicist, so he also got the Hooper Laboratories, for some of you who were here in the 60s and 70s, maybe even early 80s, they maybe remember Hooper Laboratories, and in 1983 became the first president to have a building taken away from him <laughs> when the Hooper Labs were rechristened. Halligan Lab. So it was Hooper before it was Halligan. By 1915, the trustees had come to realize that Universalist ministers were not much in the endowment building business, and they turned to an experienced academic administrator named, alas, Herman Carey Bumpus. <laughs> he was not even a Universalist, but he was a Protestant, anyhow. My biggest challenge in putting these remarks together was to find out what had been named after President Bumpus. I couldn't find anything. There was no Bumpus Hall, no Bumpus Gymnasium, that was saved for the next president, uh, President Cousins, no Bumpus Scholarship, and no one in living memory could tell me where Bumpus anything was. Finally, thanks to the university archivist, they discovered that the Bumpus family had made a gift to Tufts that had resulted in a room down in the lowest level of Tisch Library named the Bumpus Suite where it is now there, and I believe there's a plaque there, which I have not yet discovered. <laughs> Something else was special about President Bumpus, who served from 1915 to 1919. He was an eminent educator, a scientist, and a researcher. He had a PhD from Clark in 1891, among the first Americans to receive this new degree imported from Germany. The presidents of Clark, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and Harvard had all gone to German universities for this new research degree, which was already part of an ongoing battle over teaching and research. Will James, the eminent Harvard psychologist, had written an article in 1902 called The PhD Octopus, in which he stated categorically that, quote, this new degree will strangle teaching, unquote. That debate continues to this day. President Bumpus had directed the Marine Biological Laboratories at Woods Hole and the American Museum of Natural History before coming to Tufts. He was an eminent scholar. After his brief presidency of four years at Tufts, he picked up and went on to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he was a researcher and he had no patience for what was still a 19th century little college interested only in its own peace of mind and happiness. The sixth president of Tufts was John Albert Cousins, another Tufts graduate 
who became president in 1919 and died in office in 1937. He presided over Tufts at the time when ethnic quotas became the unwritten law of New England higher education, and to a considerable respect, the law of the land. We've already talked a little bit about the earliest English immigrants and how they were treated by their fellow countrymen. Imagine how immigrants were treated if they really were different. Most of the English people who got hanged or were driven out were very much like the people who drove them, drove them out. I mean, uh, um, uh, Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson were very much like the English people who got rid of them. But if you were really different, you were really in trouble. The Germans were called barbarians by Benjamin Franklin. He hated their language. He despised their habits. He despised everything about them. The Irish Catholics in the 1840s were described as maggots and vermin. Luckily for them that they had their own places of higher education already because Georgetown, Notre Dame, Holy Cross, Boston College, and other institutions provided Irish Catholic students and later faculty a safe haven and a place to study and to teach. But in the 1880s, the last two massive European immigrations took place. One Catholic and despised, one non-Christian and hated. From southern Italy, there poured into the United States hundreds of thousands of poor Italian farmers and laborers seeking a better world. Were they welcomed by their fellow Catholic Irish, who by then had climbed to lace curtain respectability? Not on your life. The Irish Catholics wanted nothing to do with their Italian co-religionists. I had a girl in class about four years ago, Emily Kenny, beautiful red-headed girl, Irish to the tips of her toes. And I said, told her the story. She said, now I know why my grandmother won't even let a can of SpaghettiOs in the house. <laughs> the uh, Irish Catholics hated the Italians. And bring anybody home, bring a Jew home, but don't bring an Italian home as a date. It, it, it simply was the nature of, uh, of the, uh, what, the, what Freud called the narcissism of minor difference. They're all Catholic, but they managed to find a reason to hate each other anyway. Uh, there was an, a lot of like, occasional digressions. There was an article in the New, uh, New York Times about two years ago, they, the European Union, uh, there was an article in the European Union, and they asked an, a southern Italian peasant how he felt about the European Union. He said, the European Union, I hate the people in the next village. <laughs> so it doesn't take a lot for people to get to hate each other, and the Protestants managed to do it, and the Catholics managed to do it. Freud was wrong on a lot of things, but on the narcissism of minor difference, he, he nailed something pretty well, I think. The Irish Catholic institutions of higher learning kept an eye on the number of Italian applicants, some of them headed for the elite institutions of New England. At the same time, from Tsarist Russia came hundreds of thousands of East European Jews, Hasidic, Yiddish-speaking, a strange alien group looked upon by the now assimilated German Jews of the United States as strangers from another planet. The Italian and Jewish immigrants were crammed already into the crowded tenement neighborhoods of New York, Chicago, Boston, and Philadelphia in places called Little Italy and Little Israel. Getting out of these ghettos was the priority. Some danced and sang their way out and wrote the great American songbook. Some shot their way out and became Murder Incorporated. Others were determined to fulfill the American dream of education and started banging on the doors of our hallowed institutions. They brought their energy, their ambition, and their ancestors' unique intellectual grammar. The Jews headed first to the more available state and city institutions. CCNY was nearly 60% Jewish by 1918. But they also set their sights on the elite schools. By the turn of the century, they were pushing out the Protestants. At a meeting of the Association of New England Deans held at Princeton in 1918, while the war was raging in Europe, Dean Frank G. Wren of Tufts and Wren Hall darkly stated the following about admissions at his school, quote, I find that more and more the foreign element is creeping in, and now, because of the enlistments, the American boys are becoming less and less, unquote. Dean Kenneth Sills of Bowdoin, at the time acting president and soon to serve as permanent president from 1918 to 1952, made it clearer, quote, we do not like to have boys of Jewish parentage at Bowdoin, unquote. A few years later, in 1922, after the Sacco Vanzetti trial had gotten underway and anarchists were being rounded up and deported back to Italy and the USSR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then a New York City lawyer, noticed that Jews made up one-third of the first-year class at Harvard. He discussed this in his letter, quote, problem, unquote, with Henry Morgenthau Sr., noted German Jew philanthropist, and then went to the Harvard Board of Overseers, of which he was a member 
And FDR later explained in a letter, quote, that over a period of years, the number of Jews should be reduced one or two percent a year until it was down to 15 percent, unquote. Harvard President Abbott Lowell in 1922 instituted an admissions policy that took into account culture, background, and characteristics that had little to do with intellect and grades. Two weeks later, the Yale administration adopted a similar admissions policy, and within the year, President Cousins of Tufts had as well. For his efforts, he had the gymnasium named after him. He kept, Tufts comfortably, he kept Tufts comfortably in the 19th century, with the exception of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, which counterintuitively came into being in 1933, dedicated to international relations at a time when America was at its most isolationist. Otherwise, Tufts was a pleasant place to spend four years, friendly, collegial, homogeneous, and mediocre. The next two presidents carried this sleepy New England college with underachieving medical and dental schools, enormous financial problems, and little ambition into the 20th century. They deserve to be considered as a tandem. Both had roots at the University of Rochester. Both were academic psychologists with PhDs, were ambitious, were ambitious beyond the vision of a satisfied faculty, served Tufts for more than a decade each, were enormously beloved, and left in their mid-50s for other careers, having felt that there was no way to shake this tranquil and friendly institution out of its contentedness. Leonard Carmichael was a man of action, as was his hand-picked successor, Nils Wessel. They were determined to make Tufts that more than it had been. They sought faculty with PhDs. At the time that Wessel was, became president, less than half the faculty had PhDs. Less than 15% of the engineering faculty had PhDs. So they sought faculty with PhDs, advocated research as part of the faculty's mission, got as far as they could, and left. The trustees begged both of them in their turn to stay. Carmichael was president from 1938 to 1952. Wessel from 1952 to 1965. Tufts became a university, but he continued to think like a college. Carmichael went on to become secretary of the Smithsonian Institute and then vice president for research and exploration at the National Geographic Society. Nils Wessel, the eighth president and a most beloved one, threw up his hands after 13 years at Tufts, went on to run the prestigious Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for the next 11 years. No amount of imploring could get them to remain as president. He had done what he could, or to make him stay as president. He had done what he could to break down the walls of parochialism. During his presidency, the first non-Harvard PhD in Tufts history was hired in the English department. Up till then, almost 100 years, the only people, well, the PhDs didn't start until after the turn of the century, but they only hired PhDs from Harvard. And he hired the first non-Harvard PhD. Uh, was hired on his watch in the English. He also saw the hiring of the English department's first Catholic and the first Jew, Bernard McCabe and Sylvan Barnett. Some of you, perhaps, of our generation remember those names. Bernard McCabe was the first Catholic, Sylvan Barnett. They didn't know yet, Sylvan Barnett, what kind of name is that? He was the first Jew, so he was closeted, but because he, he wore a bow tie, he looked like everybody else. <laughs> And the history department's first non-Protestant, which some of you probably had, George Markopoulos. He was the first non-Protestant, he was Greek Orthodox, first non-Protestant in the department. Uh, he went to the common, uh, Nils Wessel went to the Commonwealth to change the charter of Tufts to move it from college to university. He instituted 22 new PhD programs, but with a library smaller than Bowdoin's and a senior faculty still reluctant to undertake research initiatives, there were limits to what uh, Wessel could accomplish. He urged the creation of an experimental college to explore new ideas. And when he left in 1966, his hope was that his successor might build on these accomplishments, but that was not to be. The year was 1967, and Tufts had found its ninth president. Burton Hollowell had come from Wesleyan and looked forward to a productive tenure at Tufts. Instead, he got a whirlwind. No one anticipated the student rebellion of the late 1960s and the early 70s. Bert Hollowell, a decent and honorable economist from Cape Cod, had the university drop on his head. Besides having inherited budget deficits that left him financially crippled for his first years as president, building occupations, anti-war demonstrations, and anything else that angry students could blame on the university marred his presidency. Until he threw in the towel in 1975, exhausted, 
Just 60 years old, Bert Hollowell went on to a successful career managing the Keystone Funds. He left Tufts University with a balanced budget, few resources, little hope for fundraising, and a self-study report that stated that while the next five years would be difficult, the 10 years after that might be fatal. <laughs> One local historian of higher education in Boston wrote that Tufts, as an academic institution, might no longer be viable. You can try to figure out what he meant by that, but that's what he wrote in a book called The Golden Age of Boston Higher Education. The professional schools were starving, the engineering college barely was accredited, and the undergraduate admissions were accepting one out of every two applicants. Tufts was in a spiral downward, and no one knew how to stop it. Then the gods smiled on Walnut Hill. Nothing in Tufts history had prepared the community for the arrival of Jean Mayer as the 10th president of Tufts University. One is not even sure that Jean Mayer was prepared for the arrival of Jean Mayer as the 10th president. Mayer was French-born, graduated from the Sorbonne, spent his youth fighting Nazis in his native France, came to America, got a PhD in physiology from Yale, and became one of America's leading academic nutritionalists, a field that was of little interest to mainstream medical doctors. He landed at Harvard School of Public Health, worked the hallways of Washington, D.C. to make nutrition policy, and wanted desperately to be president of a university in Boston that had a medical school. He wanted to get nutrition into the minds of the MDs. Ha! <laughs> he had little hope at Harvard, so he tried Boston University. No sale. They selected John Silber when uh, Jean Mayer was a candidate. They selected Silber instead. Then he tried Tufts. No go. They picked Bert Hollowell in 1967 when Mayer was a candidate there. Then Tufts came around again after Hollowell's resignation, and again he was rejected. The presidency of Tufts was offered to Harry Wolf, provost of the Johns Hopkins University in 1976. Now normally when a candidate stays in the pool until the final three, he's serious. You expect one of those people is going to take the job. So when the offer was made to Wolf, all expectations were that he would accept. Well, instead he hesitated and two weeks later declined. Panicky trustees went to their second choice, but he had already taken another position. So out of desperation, they turned to their third choice, the Frenchman from Harvard. An emergency meeting was called at the Harvard Club in Boston with his last candidate standing and three Tufts trustees who in some embarrassment explained that they were offering Mayer the presidency even if he was the third choice. After a tense 10 seconds, Mayer leapt from his chair and yelled, I'll do it! <laughs> Tufts University was about to begin the ride of a lifetime. By the time he retired 16 years later in 1992, he had transformed this institution. He had led two fundraising campaigns that had raised $400 million, an unheard of amount for the sleepy school with a history of not asking alumni for money. When he announced his first campaign, three trustees handed in their resignations immediately, left the board. They were not about to be asked for money, and they thought this guy was a madman. But he had raised, he raised $400 million, but he also raised another $100 million of federal money for Tufts by going to the congressional delegation for help. President Mayer, as a nutritionalist, knew that the medical doctors and clinicians who ran the NIH study sections were not interested in wellness or prevention. They were interested in disease, and nutrition got short shrift. Mayer needed money. He found two young Washington, D.C. lobbyists named Schlossberg and Cassidy who had access to the Massachusetts congressional delegation. Mayer met with Tip O'Neill and Silvio Conti, told them that Massachusetts older residents needed nutritional evaluation. O'Neill told the Department of Agriculture to put in their budget $10 million for a nutrition center at Tufts University. Agriculture said, why? O'Neill said, do it and don't ask why. <laughs> Those are quotes, unquotes. <laughs> 30 years later, 30 years later, two MIT economists wrote the following in the National Bureau of Economic Working Papers. Uh, the, the quote, the birth of academic earmarks can be traced to the 1970s when Jean Mayer, president of Tufts University, engaged two lobbyists to help secure funding for an aging and nutrition center, unquote. Jean Mayer had invented the academic pork barrel, the line item appropriation earmarked for one particular school. He got another $10 million for a veterinary school and Tufts was on its way. In Mayer's second year as president, 
Admissions unexpectedly got 300 more acceptances than their model predicted. The university quickly rented the Sheraton Commander Hotel in Harvard Square, arranged for transportation, and the bumpy but always exciting ride of Jean Maier's presidency had started. He made enemies, he made friends, he charmed some, infuriated others, but was never dull or predictable. He was one of a kind. In 1991, an exhausted board of trustees pushed him out. He would have stayed forever, and he would have died in the job if he could have. The board needed more stability, however, and order in their corporate lives, and in spite of the fact that he had profoundly transformed Tufts University into a form that would have been unrecognizable 15 years earlier. All the fear, anxiety, and timidity of the pre mayer days had disappeared. The ugly, timid duckling that was Tufts was gone. The new Tufts was born. The trustees, however, needed more calm in their lives. And for the first time in Tufts history, they found a president who had been a president. Every Tufts president that had come had never been a president anywhere else. Now they found a president because they wanted somebody with experience. And these are all trustee decisions, by the way. Trustees decide. The most important thing that the trustees do is select the president and get out of the way. Uh, they found a president who had been a president. John DiBiagio had, in fact, been president twice. First at the University of Connecticut, and then at Michigan State. He was a dentist, a manager, an executive accustomed to order, delegation of authority, reason, consensus, decision making, all things that Jean Mayer, Jean Mayer did not embrace. Mayer, reluctant to leave, was made chancellor of the university, a first ever for Tufts. But without his hand on the wheel of power, Jean Mayer could not function, and he died while chancellor on January 1st, 1993. President DiBiagio enjoyed his presidency more than any other incumbent in Tufts history. He found a university with resources that it previously never enjoyed. He was a charming, outgoing, enormously friendly man, just perfect for another major fundraising campaign. And the development people took him on the road immediately. By the time he stepped down as Tufts president in 2001, Tufts had raised another $600 million, this time significantly from alumni now ready and willing to give. Between the Mayer and DiBiagio presidencies, Tufts had raised $1 billion in 25 years, a figure which would have left all previous Tufts presidents, boards of trustees, and alumni in total disbelief. He also transformed, they also transformed the board, which had been a bunch of Boston bonds lawyers, and they now went to where the money was, New York City. And as you watch the evolution of boards, those of you that are into not-for-profits or into uh, uh, the evolution of how boards move, the Tufts example is a very interesting example to see what happened, how the board shifted. Then with California and then the world. When Larry Bacow, Lawrence Bacow became the 12th president of Tufts in 2001, the university was ready for an explosion of academic achievement as it had never had been prepared for in its history. Coming from MIT, Larry Bacow possessed all the very best characteristics of Jean Mayer, vision, energy, brains, charm, and a very agreeable spouse, and those of John DiBiagio, a down-to-earth emotional intelligence that permitted him to deal with people of all levels and classes. If Jean Mayer had been the transformer of a gray, impoverished New, English, New England college into an energized and dynamic small research university, Larry Bacow could be described as the ultimate supercharged elevator operator who took the Tufts community on a whirlwind ride upwards toward universal excellence. Like Mayer, he didn't need good luck. Ma under Mayer's watch in 1986, the stock market plunged 25% in one day in 1986, but then it was 2,000 and it went to 1,500. Compare 1986 to now. 2,000 was the height of the stock market, and in one day it went to 1,500. That was under Mayer's watch. The trustees went bananas. They were ready to close the vet school, close everything. They hunkered down. They were still a bunch of Boston bonds lawyers, and the terror of a 500-point drop in, the, in the, uh, the, uh, the Dow Jones scared the bananas out of them. Ten days after Larry Bacow came to Tufts, he assumed the presidency on September 1, 2001, he faced a shocked Tufts community dealing with 9-11. His style, intelligence, and people skills showed us what we could expect from a Bacow presidency. And that's exactly what Tufts got. The building of intellectual bridges within and across the schools, the interdisciplinary cluster of faculty interests, the breaking down of walls, the lowering of hurdles, the mastery of personality and intellect capable of leading a university faculty that by nature and self-selection is an anarchy. 
I mean, we're ungovernable. What, what, what universities ultimately turn out to be are the incompetent leading the ungovernable. Most of us are incompetent as administrators and become administrators. We rise up from the faculty. The faculty remains ungovernable. And yet, we remain the envy of the world. Don't ask me how, but it happens. <laughs> Larry Bacow mastered them and showed the way. He was also aware that fundraising never stops, took on one enormous campaign for $1.2 billion, and handed the university over to Anthony Monaco, the 13th president in 2011. Uh, president Monaco is also a first for Tufts. The first MD, the first neuroscientist, the first president who, when he assumed office, arguably became instantly the most reputed research scholar on the faculty, a world-class scientific investigator who immediately went to the top of the faculty class. So now, at the end of this journey, it's time to look back and examine where we've come from. Universities don't emerge wholly formed from an egg. They are organic, grow, and change. Harvard was an undistinguished undergraduate college that enjoyed a reputation simply because it was old. Well into the 19th century, any serious American student went to Europe, most likely to Germany, to study. Money and research changed all of that. Early in the 20th century, a couple of Harvard presidents took a leap, first gradually shifting emphasis from undergraduate to graduate, to research and then to Nobel Prizes, and a changed mission. Tufts, led by its presidents, had a different course. After gradually shedding its religious orientation, it got stuck in a rut of pleasant, collegial and friendly mediocrity. The alumni were happy, the student body was happy, the board didn't have to give any money because they found presidents who were instructed not to ask. <laughs> President Carmichael and Wessel tried to change that culture, gave up and left. President Hallowell would have taken us to the next stage, perhaps, but he never had a chance. He had the 1960s and 1970s drop on him. Jean Mayer didn't ask. He was handed the university, had his own vision, charged up San Juan Hill, and dared the troops to follow him. He got to the top, saw the promised land, and died. John DiBiagio kept the money flowing and stayed out of the way. Larry Bacow took the university as it was handed to him, saw enormous opportunity, and ran with it to new heights. In 10 years, I will hopefully still be around, most likely knitting in Century Village or Sunset City, and another chronicler will sit down and tell us about the enormous achievements of Anthony Monaco. Thank you. Okay. We have time for some questions. Until uh, the first pitch, which is about any time you want. I'm not, I'm not that interested in this World Series. But I'm curious anyway. Uh, but anyway, that, we have to, we're supposed to be here till 9 if you want to. But uh, any questions or anything? You, any questions you have or any observations or any discussions or disagreements or points you want to make? There are, there are people here from all the generations. Your perceptions would be very interesting, how you saw life when you saw it. In 1978, two years into the Mayer presidency, uh, they were building a com the computer science center in the basement, back basement of Miller Hall. And they decided that it was OK to jackhammer through some uh, ventilation channels like it's set starting at seven in the morning, so that they could they could build uh, air conditioning down there, I guess. And when students complained that they didn't think jackhammering was appropriate at seven in the morning, his response was, "I was in the French Resistance, and bombs and guns were going off all around you know, us." My ear. Any time you asked him a question, his answer was, "I killed Nazis with my bare hands." <laughs> he was. In fact, the first time he met me. I said, my president, my am Saul Gilman. He said, oh, you're chairman of the German department, are you not? I said, yes, I am. He says, you know, I fought Nazis all my life. <laughs> I said, yes, President Meyer. I said, but the French invented the word collaborateur. <laughs> and he stopped for a second. He says, ah, oh, you're right, you're right. <laughs> we became friends. He never trusted me. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, oh, Bill Wessel, he, he was so popular that he was trying to shake things up. He didn't break any eggs. Nils was really wonderful. Sweet man. I, I, I served one year with him. I think this is my seventh or eighth president. And Wessel was very, by the time I met Wessel, he was already fed up. Uh, and he, he, was, he could be a little bit brusque. But at a faculty meeting, he, was, he, he, all, he, he, was, he had come here as an assistant professor. 
He had been dean of students, then dean of the faculty. He had grown up with the whole faculty. He had a PhD, a decent scholar, and he was surrounded by a bunch of, per so he tried to bring in new people, but we didn't have the resources to bring in enough. So you could bring in a couple of new people and try to, but he, he couldn't change the nature of the, so then he took the PhD jump, he leaped into that cauldron, and the, the, the accrediting agencies laughed. They said, what are you doing, building 22 PhD programs? You have no faculty who do research, and you don't have any library. And Will Essel said, I'm going to try to jumpstart it. So he kept trying to jumpstart, and he, he just gave up. But, and Carmichael also had that vision. They were two peas in the pod. Carmichael brought him from Rochester. Fresh new PhD, doing some research, brought him here as dean of students, assistant professor. So Wessel grew up at Tufts. His family, everybody knows his family. He, was, he died only a few years ago. But he was a much, much, much beloved. And we asked him, you say, what was the most important thing you did? I, we talked before he died. He said, the most important thing I did was the experimental college. He said that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he said, though, my biggest failure was not finding a donor to name the library. So the, they had a name, the trustees named it the Wessel Library. Normally, that would have gone to a donor, but they, couldn't, they didn't have any donors. So they named it after Nils. And uh, then they changed it when they got a donor. So he was, he was the Hooper plus one. Hooper lost it to Halligan, and Wessel lost it to Tish. But they put a plaque up. <laughs> Please. I have to ask, in 61, 1961, paid a grand total of 900 for the year? Yeah. What's happened? Oh, what's happened? The exponential explosion of costs at the university. You know, I'm not an economist, I can't tell you. But one of the points made about busting through Miller Hall basement to build computers. I mean, a God only knows what the investment in technology has been over the last 50 years. You know, 1450 to 1500, one technology, movable type, changed the world. 1950 to 2000, this technological explosion must have cost billions in American universities. So that's been one. I mean, all, we have, must have 300 new people working at Tufts in IT. I didn't even know what IT meant until uh, I got rid of my Smith Corona portable <laughs> typewriter. I typed my first book on a Smith Corona portable typewriter. And I walk around with my PhD dissertation to show the graduate students what carbon paper is. <laughs> you know, we just got into a different world. The university knowledge simply exploded. Along with that explosion, uh, exploded costs. Now. You know, we also get to look a little bit like the Neville or the Concord. It used to be f four broken chairs and a broken bridge table for furniture. Now the kids want this. BU has uh, a alternative costs, charges. You want a real fancy place? You can pay this much. We won't do that. Uh, the idea of having differential costs for undergraduate housing, many of the universities are doing this now. And so they are, we're in a, in a, in a tight, interesting phase of higher education. Still, though, 60% of American students go to universities where the tuition is $6,000 a year or less. The state system is, if we, don't if we don't gouge, kill it, is still a bargain. 1,500 community colleges, you can still manage it. Then you got other people who are saying we have too many people going to college. I don't buy that. But, you know, uh, it's still a we, we, we haven't solved it. We don't do well on social policy. We don't do well on national policy. And we got these costs going off the charts. I don't know what the answer is. I know I can identify how it happened. I mean, I came to Tufts teaching four courses a semester. Then my load was reduced to two. Then it was reduced to one. And so, it, it, but those things, but that, the trade-off for that is we have a research-oriented faculty. We, we haven't changed our mission that much. We're still a teaching university where everybody does research. But we give about 135 PhDs a year now. Berkeley gives 900. UCLA gives 800. Harvard gives 700. MIT gives 700. The definition of a research university is what happens when the graduate students go on strike. They close it. <laughs> they do 50 to 75% of all the grading and 25 to 50% of all the teaching. That's not our model. We are a different model. We're, we're Georgetown without crucifixes. <laughs> we're Dartmouth, Dartmouth not in the boonies. We are, Brown is the other close one to, to pee in the pod. So w there's a different model. For lots of different universities have different models. Our model is one that still will be expensive, but we're not going to invest the amount of money in research that a school that has a faculty that only wants to win the Nobel Prize. And that's what many schools want. 
We had one Nobel Prize winner here. Who is it? No. Alan Cormack, professor of physics, got the Nobel Prize in 1980 for uh, uh, in medicine, in medicine, for writing on the back of an envelope the mathematical calculation for three-dimensional tomography. Without his formula, we don't have CAT scan. That's basic research. He, has a, he had a master's degree from the University of Kenya. White man, PhD, uh, no PhD, master's degree. He did the calculation. Somebody started using that calculation. The next thing you know, you had three-dimensional CAT scan, tomography, all of those three-dimensional machines that we have now. Alan Cormack, so he won the Nobel Prize by accident. <laughs> Again, uh, just then, but somebody reset. But, and, uh, but we don't make the kind of investment. And yet, you're absolutely right. I, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. All I know is we're, uh, you know, American higher education is pretty darn good. And uh, when they say uh, we no longer have everybody in our rear view window, I don't know who's ever going to catch us in our lifetimes. Maybe China and Japan, uh, China or uh, India someday, but right now the University of Calcutta is 400,000 students and we are still the envy of the world. Our model is an interesting model, the Tufts model. But I, I don't have an answer for you about how the costs are skyrocketing. One of my colleagues, my dearest friend Dan Ungen in the economics department, some of you know, had a, had a method. He used to say it's the, um, the, the Chevrolet factor. Uh, tuition should be the exact same cost as a four-door Impala. Now, I don't know where we are with that. I think he... he <laughs> that was the only problem difference was you paid every year. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, at least he said that at least shows you that something's under control. But it wasn't. Peter, excuse me, I had your hand up. Oh, sorry, sorry, your hand up. Uh, anybody else? Please. Moises? What, what are some of the main items in, that you think should be in the agenda for the. You're asking me? Yeah. I'm talking about presidents who are dead. Don't ask me what's in the agenda. <laughs> what are you talking about? I have no agenda. Back out of the Monaco, like, what's, the, you, what's coming up? What's next? I don't know. I have no idea. It's the vision of the president. Okay, so you know, whatever the president's vision is, he has maybe something that he has in his mind that he may share, or there may be something like Mayer didn't share. Mayer announced at his inauguration, he announced that we we're going to have a vet school. There wasn't a trustee who knew this. <laughs> he announced it at we, you his inauguration. He announced it at the, vet, at the inauguration. It was indoor because it was rainy. Uh, it was in the gym. And uh, he announced we're going to have a vet school. Trustees are looking around. Who is this guy? <laughs> they almost fired him after three years. They almost got rid of him. And a few trustees said, this has got to be the future. We've got to hang with this guy. So they started taking votes of no confidence in my air. And they took a couple, but the, the chairman of the board refused to count them. And he took over. And, but my air's vision was not anything that anybody else knew about. So can I, can I ask you one more question? Yeah. It's kind of related. So what were the main items in... <clears throat> Larry Backhoe's agenda? Uh, I think Larry uh, always said to me when he talk, we talked to the faculty, he saw research at the confluence of disciplines, not in here where the discipline started. He was interested in clustering faculty and getting people to do more interdisciplinary work, cross campuses, make the silos thinner and the, and the hurdles lower. How do you turn this into a university? Faculty are by nature you know, they do some interdisciplinary work, but they like the department structure. And we stay, tend to stay in departments and interdisciplinary journals. So I think Larry had a vision of making that. Also wanted to upgrade the medical to the health sciences. We built some buildings down there. We have more to go. And he wanted to make financial aid the centerpiece of his thing. We were need blind for two years before the crash. And so he was interested in students. You know, he was uh, provost at MIT, a chancellor at MIT, and it was on his watch that that kid walked into the river and drowned. Scott Kruger, I think his name was. That scarred by Larry. Larry was so focused on students. And that was, that, that, I mean, so he didn't want drinking. He didn't want, he, he wanted, to, and he wanted to get kids into college who otherwise didn't have an opportunity. But he was focused on research. He was tenurable. It's another interesting thing. Look at the faculty, look at the presidents, and you ask yourself the question, which one was tenurable? Which one would have gotten tenure at the time? Well, we only have tenure since 1950, 55. I got, ten, actually, uh, and we only had peer review since 1968. Uh, the dean gave me tenure by putting his hands on my head. I got tenure in 1966 by the dean saying, poof, you have tenure. No peer review, no outside review, no nothing. 
That was 1966. I had written one article, and I had a book manuscript out ready to go. I was considered whew, a hot shot. Uh, but um, you know, I, that's the way it was in '66. Then we got peer review, and things changed. But uh, you know, you look at presidents of universities and ask which one was tenurable. Uh, Jean Mayer did not have tenure at Tufts. No, no department gave him tenure. Biology didn't give him tenure. The medical school wanted nothing to do with him. They, I was provost. They said, please close his office down here. We don't want him around. But the chairman of the Department of Physiology, I met him downtown. We looked at the, uh, the skeleton of the Human Research Center at 711 Washington Street that Mayer got the $10 million for. He said, that building might as well be on the planet Krypton, as far as I'm concerned. We're not interested in nutrition. Nobody down here is interested in nutrition, and we don't want it. So they didn't want him down here. They didn't want him as president. But my air wasn't going to stop for anything. And poof, except today, there are still only three or four medical schools of the 129 that have clinical nutrition programs in their departments of medicine. They still haven't really made a, a huge leap forward in nutrition. But uh, each, so each president has its own thing. Uh, Mayer was tenurable, but didn't have tenure here. He didn't have tenure at Harvard. The School of Public Health did not have tenure. He told people he had tenure, but he lied occasionally. <laughs> he didn't have tenure. Mayer did not have tenure. Uh, John DiBiagio was not tenurable. Larry Bacow was given tenure in five different departments instantly. Uh, if uh, if uh, uh, Anthony Monaco wants tenure, poof, he's got tenure in biology, probably physiology, and three more departments downtown, genetics, and whatever else. He is a world-class geneticist and neuroscientist. Uh, but at Harvard, they brought in, they, you know, they had a president in our lifetime who was not tenurable. Neil Rudenstein was not tenurable. He had been provost at uh, Princeton. Uh, they picked him as president of Harvard, and he very rarely ever stood in front of the faculty. He sat in the audience. He was very deferential to the fact because he knew he wasn't tenurable. Derek Bach was a very good scholar, very good lawyer, a very good uh, labor scholar of labor law. And Summers is a world-class economist. He turned out to be a lousy president, but a tenurable faculty member. He had tenure there, and uh, so and, and Drew Faust is tenurable. She's a tenured member of the faculty. So, but not every institution will bring in a tenurable faculty member as president. They'll go to Wall Street. They'll go somewhere else. They'll do something else and bring in a different kind of vision. The guy who transformed Dartmouth was a Hungarian Jew, Jewish mathematician, John Kemeny. In the 1970s, he took this wild, fraternity-oriented, going for broke place that was a party school like no other party school. Kemeny came in, created the trimester system, brought in women, uh, invent, gave him BASIC, and he invented BASIC. He was a super quintessential intellectual faculty member who transformed Dartmouth into a rigorous high quality institution. He retired and they immediately went 180 degrees the other way and appointed the chairman of the board as their new president, who bled green. He was Dartmouth <laughs> through and through. He had a terrible presidency because the faculty wanted no part of him and they ignored him and after five years he quit. But so the, the, how the faculty, our presidents are and what their visions are, are interesting. Please. Um, you talked about the change of Tufts from this sleepy um, collegial school. Friendly, to, very friendly. Yeah, to this prestigious university it is today. And I a little less friendly, okay. but well, that's, that's the, way, really that's the price you pay. My question yeah. really is yeah. how do you see the change in the student body that's evolved under each of these presidents? Unbelievable diversity. And, and the effect of the presidents. Yeah. Well, it's the, the culture, the changing times. You can't have total collegiality without. And, and, and excellence. You got to have some, Mayer at his first faculty meeting said, forgive me if I misspeak. I have never been at a faculty, never been on a faculty where the people actually seem to like each other. I said, I've only been at Yale and Harvard. <laughs> he said that at his first faculty meeting. Mayer brought just the right amount of elbow and vinegar to the equation, to the calculus. And, uh, and, and, and made a couple of you know, daring and nasty occasional, but made sure he stayed civil. But the faculty changed dramatically in the last 30 or 40 years. New kinds of people were coming in. Different, a different intellectual grammar was coming. You know, uh, so that you got argument, you got debate, you got re rage, you got Afghanistan in higher education. And now there are departments all over the country that are in receivership because they hate each other so much that they have to get somebody from another department to chair it. That's the nature of the academic 
creature. There must be a hundred university uh, uh, departments in the country that are being chaired by a biologist chairing Romance Languages. Romance Languages is the biggest one, by the way, because they've got so the mixture in there is they've got at least three francophone communities. They got France, then they got Caribbean, and they got Africa. All three, and they all, like Freud says, they'll find a way to hate each other. The Spaniards have what? Iberia, Caribbean. South America, they managed to find ways to hate each other. French, Spanish, throw Portuguese and Italian in, you really got a stew, and they can get to hate each other. I mean, look, biology, 30 years ago, they broke down over big animal, little animal. They were, and they divided into two departments. They couldn't stand dealing with each other because some people, what was coming in, just the, the, uh, the molecular level people wanted nothing to do. What's a miracle is that the physicists have stayed together. The physicists who do what? Atoms and the universe, and they stay together. Please. Um, I'm from the medical school, so I kind of have a Which department? Or? No, I, I, I raise money for the medical oh. school. Right? Yeah. But at any rate, uh, one of the things we're proud of, in, and I think what made the medical school in the 40s and 50s, was the growth of the faculty from Europe. At that time, I mean, without that, I mean, it's a very proud part of our history. <coughs> yeah. All of our alumni from the '67, they're all talking about those people who came. Is there anything that's true like that here on the, the Medford campus uh, that that sort of infused? Not to the same extent. I mean, I know what, what down there the accents in the dental school and medical school in the 40s, 50s, they were, were really remarkable. And my heir immediately gravitated to them. He found his deepest friendships in the dental school. Helmi Fogels from Latvia, uh, all the Greeks who, I mean, they, they, what, what joined them all together? They all fought the Nazis. And so they were all, they all fought the Germans. That, that bound, bind them all together. The medical school made it. The medical school also got sanctioned officially by the, uh, the AAMC for letting in too many Catholics and Jews. They were sanctioned. There was an official letter of sanction from it. It's in Ludmiller's book. He says, Tufts and Georgetown were the two schools that got nailed for letting in too many of the others. Who did the sanction? Uh, the AAMC, the Ameri uh, Association of, um, uh, Association. of Medical Colleges. What? Yeah, they, they do the accrediting, the accrediting agency. But it was the Europeans coming in, the refugees. Here we got some. George Halm came to uh, uh, history and then went to Fle uh, economics and then went to Fletcher. And we had two or three refugees. His wife, Laura. Halm was a full professor at a German university at the age of 26, professor of economics. His wife was a Jew. So he left, took Laura with him. She became a lecturer in the German department. But he went to Fletcher eventually. But we didn't get a lot. We were the medical school. The arts and sciences were still pretty parochial. I mean, in the 40s and 50s, as I said, the first Protestant is still alive, or my friend George Markopoulos in the history department. History and English were the two bastions. They didn't want to have this intellectual grammar that was coming from pushy people. And pushy, what they, they called, one of the presidents of the American Historical Society called urban bred scholars. Urban bred scholars equaled what? Jews and Catholics. They were urban bred. And he talked about them as we have too many urban bred. Uh, President Breitenbaugh said that. So, but the medical school was desperate. They were, I mean, they had nothing. I mean, Flexner had said in 1912 to 13, close it. He told, the, of the, when the Flexner report came out in 1910 or 12 or 13, uh, they were looking at American medical schools, many of them were like barber shops. He looked at Tufts and he said, close it. It shouldn't stay open. But they kept it open. And then they got the 30s and the 40s, the refugees coming in, made it happen. And uh, it was remarkable how it all came. And some of those guys, the hospital they built, they were uh, remarkable people and became deans and, and kept the place going, kept it alive. And the thing that makes the medical school special, you'll talk to any student who will say, uh, besides the Chinese food down there, it's the friendliness of the faculty. What really makes it go, there they kept their civility, even though you, know, I you get the same kind of politics. The Department of Medicine, they call the cardiologist the third rail. If you touch him, you die. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can get internal squabbles in departments, any school, in any discipline. But the medical school, from the t student point of view, they love the faculty. They love the teaching. They just think they're terrific people. Cardiac surgeons. Ca cardiac surgeons. Touch them, you die. Third rail.
So thank you. For Anybody want to schmooze? I'll stick around. Well, we're, that's that's all I'm here to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say to invite everyone. Oh, there's reception. Okay. Reception out in. Uh, All right, is that history? <laughs> Good job. Thank you very much. I'm always worried. <laughs> Teaching you without a yeah, license. Well, I know. You're, 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 you're.